We begin tonight with Donald Trump's latest Twitter outburst, a series of racist attacks on oversight chair Elijah Cummings, starting with calling his Maryland district a, quote, disgusting rat and rodent infested mess. And when critics said calling an American city rodent infested was racist, he tried to flip the script and without explanation insisted Cummings was a racist. The hits continuing today, all of it part of Trump's pattern of attacking Democrats of color and denigrating their constituents, a pattern that goes back years. Trump responded, tweeting, Congressman John Lewis should spend more time on fixing and helping his district, which is in horrible shape and falling apart, not to mention crime infested. The president then suggested they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came. Here we go again. President Trump spends another weekend unleashing another Twitter attack at another member of Congress who happens to be of color. And we have new reporting that Trump isn't just deploying racist attacks. He's doing it purposefully because he thinks it's going to help him politically. The Washington Post reporting that Trump's advisors believe the overall message sent by such attacks is good for the president among his political base. And as The New York Times points out, most modern presidents have, quote, shied away from overt racial debates. Trump seems to be going out of his way lately to engage in one, even if his advisors continue to deny what is in plain sight. It has absolutely zero to do with race. You say it has zero to do with race. There is a clear pattern here, Mick. Infested. It sounds like vermin. It sounds subhuman. They're, they're, and these are all six members, uh, uh, members of Congress who are people of color. I think you're spending, spending way too much time reading between the lines. Does anybody, I'm not reading between the lines. Anybody, I'm reading the lines. Does anybody, I'm reading the lines. My panel on all of this, Brittany Cooper, professor at Rutgers University, Mara Gay, a member of the New York Times editorial board, and Melissa Mark Viverito, former speaker of the New York City Council, and a senior advisor to the Latino uh, Victory Fund. Mara, I'm going to start with you. The House voted two weeks ago to condemn Trump's racist remarks, of course, when he attacked the four uh, freshman congresswomen. He's keeping it up, though. So how is the president stopped when it comes to this racist uh, rhetoric that he's using right yeah. now? So there's a couple things that I, I think need to happen. One is that, you know, right now we need to understand that the silence from Republicans and the silence from white Americans in positions of prominence is deafening. Um, whether you're the coach of a little league soccer team or you're a member of Congress, or you're the head of a multinational corporation, this is the time to speak out and tell America what your values are and stand up for your fellow citizens. Um, I also think that it's really important that the Democrats start to understand and learn how to talk about race and racism. I don't believe that this president can be defeated by ignoring race. I actually think that Do this... Do you think Democrats aren't doing a good job no, of talking about racism? No, I don't think racism? Democrats have any plan or any understanding, um, at least as a, as a party, of how to talk about uh, race and racism in this country. I think what you really need to do in 2020 is go right at it and make this a contest between America and the values that we care about and Trumpism. And this, is a, this is a moral crisis as much of a, a, as a political one. And it's not enough to just ignore it and, and call the, the racist tweets a distraction, because in fact, uh, Trump is running on the racism itself. So that's what you need to attack. So are you talking both about the 2020 candidates along with legislators in Washington as well that neither know how to talk about race in this country right now and what's happening? I think there are very few people on the national political stage who understand how to talk about race mm -hmm. and racism, unfortunately. Who, who does, in your mind, know how to talk about race in this uh, country? You know, I think that uh, Donald Trump understands how to talk about race with his base. It uh, doesn't mean that I agree with what he says. I think Barack Obama understood it. I think you have people like Elizabeth Warren who are, who are doing a lot of work mm. to understand how to talk about it. Uh, people like, frankly, Mayor Bill de Blasio know how to talk about race. There are some examples and there are some times where people can learn and, and uh, understand what the history is, which is part of this conversation that is often ignored. But I think the Democratic Party needs a crash course in how not just to ignore the rhetoric, but actually confront it. Brittany, um, with very few exceptions, Republicans are criticizing uh, the president. Mark Meadows today came out with a very soft uh, crit criticism of the president, to say the least. And we're going to be uh, reading that a little bit later uh, in the show. What does this say about the president's hold on the Republican Party 
right now? Are they fearful for lo uh, of losing control come 2020? Are well, these people whose seats are up for grabs and that's why they're not speaking out? Um, I'm not inclined to read them generously. I think that part of the reason that they're resistant is because it is a winning strategy politically for Trump. This is both an overt call and a dog whistle. Even even the, you know, the tweets about Al Sharpton today, these attacks whip up a very particular group. It's aggrieved white men. Um, and those men then go on the attack and they don't just go on the attack in the voting booth. They also harass, they tweet, they email, they they put out violent threats towards people who d d disagree with Trump. So I think that's one thing. The other thing that is the more disturbing thing, um, Republicans are also going along with Trump because even though he's a vile person in terms of his racial politics, he's getting a Republican agenda done, right? Their obstructionism in the Senate in particular, Mitch McConnell is about to, you know, confirm all of these judges, these conservative judges to federal positions. Uh, he's going to get his money for the border wall. The Supreme Court is going to let that go forward. So all of these very bread and butter Republican issues are happening under a Trump administration. They don't have any incentive. They don't have any moral incentive. And as long as he can continue to appeal to this fear that they have, that they are being pushed to the past, that they are being pushed to the back burner, and he can whip up that white male aggrievement and entitlement, then what they see is that their fear and their sense that they are under threat overrides any yes. sort of moral commitment to a kind of empathy or care, or just a commitment to the rule of law, legality, and ethics. All of that goes out the window. If someone's coming in your house, your ethics go out the window, right? You just think, how do I save myself? Mm -hmm. He has all these folks thinking they're drowning, and so they're, they're fighting every Everybody, they're pushing everybody underwater to save themselves. Well, so I want to read a part of this op-ed from the Washington Post by these 149 African-American aides uh, to the Obama administration. And it reads in part this, we refuse to sit idly by as racism, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia are wielded by the president and any elected official uh, complicit in the poisoning of our democracy. We call on local, state, and congressional officials, as well as presidential candidates to articulate their policies and strategies for moving us forward as a strong democracy. The way in which the Republicans and, and, and Trump, it seems, and the people surrounding him think that the talk around racism is going to drive his base to the polls. Do you think that race can galvanize the Democratic base and drive them to the polls for greater voter turnout come 2020 as well? Without a doubt. And when you talk about the voting base of the Democratic Party, it's people of color, whether you're Latinos or African-Americans. Those are the two driving and, and major voting blocks for this party. So an, a rejection or inability to speak eloquently around this issue means that you're alienating a large percentage of your voting bloc. Let's be clear. Anyone that enables this racist president is racist. Mm -hmm. Racism is systemic. It's, it's in our systems, whether it's education, criminal justice. Those in power are the only ones that can set an example of who we are as a society and what our values are. So for the Republicans or even Democrats to sit idly by and sit in silence, you are enabling racism to perpetuate in society. And this is the time to stand up against a bully and against a racist. And there's no many, how many any other ways do we have to express ourselves and say this president is racist? We shouldn't even having a debate on whether or not he is. He is. Yes. And that has to be clearly articulated by the press and everybody else. There should can, be no doubt about it. Can that. this literally inspire Mara, someone in Baltimore waking up tomorrow morning to say, you know what, that's it. I'm going to the polls and I'm going to vote against this president come 2020 or someone in Minnesota who supports yeah. Ilhan Omar or someone in Michigan who res supports Rashida Tlaib. I think it absolutely can and it will. I think there are a lot of Americans who are people um, of goodwill who regret their vote or who stayed home last time. Um, those folks are living in swing districts. Some of them are in my own family. Um, and, you know, I think that the Democrats need to talk to them, but they also need to really organize uh, their base and get their base to the polls. Um, it's as much about conversion, as we say in politics, you know, uh, making your argument and changing people's minds as it is about really motivating your own voters. And I, I think really uh, Democrats are motivated, but the message needs to continue to be dri driven home uh, that this president is a racist and beyond that, that our uh, existence um, as a democratic nation and a country of pluralism and a country that values diversity and that cares about um, human rights is at stake. 
and, and the rule of law is at stake. And, and I really I don't think that that's uh, it's it's not understated. This is an existential crisis. And this, I mean, and for, for yeah. you know, Latino communities, African American, you know, it's exhausting. We wake up every day wondering what is the new level of depravity and what what uh, you know what impact is it going to have? We see the families being ripped apart. We see children dying in custody in the U.S. government. I mean, this is an assault each and every day. This is very real. So if we don't shape up and try to figure out how we speak to our base as Democrats, uh, particularly because this is what. We, 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 what we have to do and we have to motivate our base, we have to be able to articulate what is our vision, our values, and what role do we play as Latinos and African Americans within that dynamic. Um, and look, I actually think the candidate that is speaking best to race right now is Julian Castro. Mm -hmm. um, he is the one who is talking about these issues that are inspiring young activists, and I think we need to be paying more attention to him. I think we need to be paying more attention to Kirsten Gillibrand, who, has, who was more conservative and who has had a shift and who walks people through that shift. I think, of course, Elizabeth Warren, I think Kamala Harris, I think Cory Booker. Um, I think there are some people that we really need to be paying attention to how they handle racial discourse. But I also think that there's a more fundamental thing that we need to be doing, which is talking to people about fear. The problem on the on the liberal left as well is that what Trump does is he whips up everyone's sense of fear and their sense of anxiety. Even on the liberal left, if you just think about aging, no one wants to be told that they don't matter anymore. And he is playing on people's fear on the right and the left that if we let all well, of Why these don't you necessarily think that this conversation that you're talking about, this conversation about fear. It happened a lot in 2016, especially about the comments uh, when he that he made about the Mexicans coming over with drugs yeah. and rapists. That conversation was had. It was had in the media. We had those conversations. It was had by the candidates. Sure. Uh, it didn't necessarily resonate. Sure, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but at the end of the day, Donald Trump is the president of the United States. So why do you think it'll resonate this time around? Um, look, I think because now people have the evidence of how Trump governs, and they don't necessarily have the language. Before, he had the promise and the potential. Now we've seen the levels of destruction he has committed, That's and folks cool. are saying, I didn't believe you before. Now I have evidence. But the other thing is that very often white men, because they are white men and they have had authority, we invest them with trust. And the thing that we, have, you know, we, our system is set up for us to do that. The thing we've got to be saying is look, you think that he is trustworthy because of his position, because he is rich, all of these things, but what has he actually done for you besides turn the country into turmoil, make you wake up every morning and feel anxious about what's going to happen, lock up kids, which no person right. with any moral compass would ever believe in. If we can just tap into those issues, I think it's a one-two punch. I think we have to name racism for what it is and say that he is a racist, but I also think that we can take care of the emotional responses he inspires. The country is all on the highest level of fear and anxiety. And if a candidate does not figure out how to speak to that emotional life, people don't vote just on policy issues. They never do. They vote on, on the candidate that they trust. Right. What, what's right. interesting to me, though, as, as you were listing the candidates that you think speak mo best about race, Kamala Harris was number four on your list. Cory Booker was number five. They sure. have been the two candidates that have been the most outspoken about race, especially when it came to attacking former Vice President Joe Biden's record, uh, oh. long history. Just because they're African-American doesn't mean Nothing that they have Nothing to do right. with the fact that they're no, African-American. But you. the fact that I'm they not... have been attacking Joe Biden sure, with his, but that, but, and but, she obviously Kamala Harris was the most sure, outspoken the, the, on the debate stage, especially when it came to the, the busing issue. The problem is that what we keep on thinking is that because candidates are black, that they actually have a great racial analysis. I don't think Barack Obama was great on race. I think that he participated. Look, there are things I admired about President Obama, but I think he participated in this false equivalence where he would say the worker who lost their job in the factory is like the the black person who had been aggrieved and couldn't get a mm -hmm. home loan. One came out of a system of discrimination. Right. The other came out of bad policy on the right. Those are not the same thing. And so the inability to make these distinctions, President Obama contributed to that. And so we've actually got to tell a more honest truth. All people are being messed with by a system that doesn't take care of the everyday working middle class person. But the histories that get us there are different. And if we respect the American public, we'll actually speak to them as people who can understand complexity. And can I just tell you, ladies, that at the beat is the best. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Uh, sure. Brittany Cooper, uh, Maren Gay, uh, Melissa, Mark Viverito. Thank you guys all. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.